You, you, the book makes it clear that you would prefer to see a world without religion. Uh, but then the argument comes from many people who say, well, how about the relief that religion provides to many people, like people who have lost their loved one and think, well, at least I, I can meet them and, on the other side. Yes. Um, I do think that's a serious point. People do undoubtedly get consolation from religion. The first thing to say about that is that because something is comforting and consoling, that doesn't, of course, make it true. Uh, it's obviously a logical fallacy to suggest that because something makes you feel good, that makes it true. There are those who would rather not hear the truth, and a, a good test would be, would you wish your doctor to tell you when you have a fatal disease? Some people would prefer not to know when they have a fatal disease. Some people would prefer their doctor to tell them. And doctors often make a judgment whether they're dealing with the kind of patient who needs to know the truth or the kind of patient who would prefer not to know the truth. So I think it's rather an, an analogous case. I don't think you could ever say that it would be uh, a justification for not writing a book, the fear that somebody might be upset, upset about it. If you're going to be upset about reading my book, don't read it. How about the, the side argument that people say that is another plus of religion is the, the fact that it has inspired magnificent works of art through the ages, you know, from the Sistine Chapel to, to the music of Bach, and I know you were a fan of Bach, and uh, so do you think the inspiration is an important factor? Yes, I mean, th there's no doubt at all that religion has inspired great art, great music, uh, great poetry, great literature. The Bible itself is great literature, certainly in the uh, 17th century English, which I'm most familiar with, and my guess is that uh, the Bible in Portuguese is probably great literature as well. I do feel very strongly that all children should learn uh, about the Bible, should read the Bible, because you cannot appreciate literature, you can't appreciate European literature, you can't appreciate European history uh, without knowing the Bible. Uh, and so th th that I feel very strongly. Um, if we get rid of religion, then biblical history, biblical literature will go on being important in just the same way as the Greek gods are important for understanding literature. You can't appreciate much of literature unless you know about Zeus and Apollo. You can't appreciate Wagner unless you know about the Norse gods. Nobody believes in them anymore, but they're a part of our cultural heritage. Things like the Sistine Chapel, uh, things like the music of Bach, well, that is, of course, be very beautiful, very important. If you ask, does that in any way support the contention that there's some validity in religion, of course it doesn't. Um, great artists go where the money is. Uh, and um, it's always been the case that rich people are able to commission the art that they want. And in the time of uh, Michelangelo, in the time of Bach, the people who had the money were the churches. And so that's why great art was done for the churches. It doesn't, of course, make it true. It, I would even go so far as to say that the, the story, for example, of the St. Matthew Passion uh, is a very, very moving story. It's not just the music of Bach that makes it moving. It is a moving story in itself. And one can, of course, appreciate the drama and the emotions of great fiction. You can still appreciate the Bible story even though they are fiction. So as part of your interpretation of the Bible as fiction, the, the concept of the world being created in, you know, in a few days, at a certain time, about 6,000 years ago, all at once, that goes into an enormous contradiction with, with the evidence of science. So you think that is the part that should be rejected? Well, um, the world is filled with beautiful origin myths, and anthropologists will give you hundreds, probably thousands of origin myths, which have great poetic beauty, and uh, which are well worth studying as literature as, as cultural artifacts. The particular origin myth that we're most familiar with, which is the, uh, the Jewish one, 
uh, which I think has its origins in, in, ba in, in Babylon, is uh, no more beautiful, no less beautiful than any other. The astonishing thing, and it, I think it would have astonished um, Darwin, would he alive to see it still today, is that in many parts of the world, that, that particular origin myth is believed literally. As you say, the, the world was created in six days, 6,000 years ago. Now that's not just slightly wrong, that is gigantically, colossally wrong. And a, a way to illustrate that is to say since the true age of the world is 4.6 billion years, to believe that the world is only 6,000 years old is equivalent to believing that, I calculated it, the width of North America from New York to San Francisco is eight meters. As an evolutionist, a Darwinist, you obviously don't believe in an afterlife, which is the inspiration for many people as a purpose of life. So in your concept, what is the purpose of life? Is it life itself? Well, um, one kind of purpose of life, the, the biologist's one, is the one that is the basis of my first book, The Selfish Gene. Uh, and on that scientific level, the purpose of life is the propagation of DNA. And there is poetic inspiration in that, but it probably isn't going to be very satisfying to individuals. Individuals make their own purpose in life. Each one of us, to a greater or lesser extent, lives by our purposes. It may be to write a great book, a great symphony. Uh, it may be to win a football match. It may be to um, bring up your children in health and happiness. There are all kinds of purposes that individuals can make. Every one of us can make. And we'd better make our own purposes, because this is the only life we're going to get. And so the belief that this is the only life we're going to get sharpens, sharpens our view of the world. It makes us value life more. It makes us take life seriously, but it also makes us enjoy life to the full, because this is the only life we're going to get. And to lead this life in a less than full fashion, because you think you're going to get another one, is a terrible, terrible waste of the gigantic privilege it is to have a life at all. Because we, each of us, are enormously privileged. If you calculate the odds against each one of us coming into existence, our parents had to meet, not only did they have to meet, they had to have sexual intercourse at a particular time, a particular sperm had to find a particular egg, the same thing had to happen to our grandparents, our great-grandparents, all the way back through the pilgrimage to the origin of life. Not one of us here has any right to expect to exist. We do exist by a fantastic piece of good chance. Don't waste it. It's the only life you're going to get. How about there is a 